What's going on guys? So I got an interesting email from a, uh, a young man who lives in Southern Florida and he wanted to get into RVs and reviewing them, kind of like I do. Well, you know, uh, it was an interesting email and he basically wanted to kind of prepare himself for what he might need to do to film RVs and I wrote a you know, rather lengthy email response kind of guiding him through the path of a day in the life of Big Truck, Big RV, and, and what I do whenever I am preparing for and filming RVs at dealership locations. So I want to talk about that because it's a little interesting, and I think, you know, a lot of people kind of want to know how I do my filming, and specifically the order and what happens before, during, and after. have already called and spoken to my contacts at the various RV dealerships to see what new inventory they might have available. Sometimes it's as easy as simply going on their website and seeing what's available versus what's on its way. And I have identified floor plans, you know, for multiple units that I would like to film at a few RV dealerships. And I'm fortunate because I have a lot of RV dealerships that reside in my area. Unfortunately, not many of them actually carry motorhomes. They're all pretty much towable units. And if I want to travel a couple hours away, I have access to probably three or four dozen RV dealerships. Now, the biggest part of this is that relationship that you have to form with the RV dealership because they have to see value in what you're doing to permit you to come on their lot. In some cases, RV dealerships reach out and they want to actually pay you to come out to their, their lot. And I don't do too many of those. I've done a few, but very few. And I've always disclosed it when I have done that. Now, the, uh, the big thing that you have to keep in mind when it comes to filming RVs is you don't want to just film the same units all the time. You want to film units that are a little unique or maybe a newer version of a unit that you may have filmed a couple years ago. If you're just getting into it, then everything, of course, is going to be pretty unique. So, you know, you're unlikely to run across the same floor plan unless you're intentionally looking for that specific floor plan. All right, so again, the relationship is probably the single most important aspect of it. And a lot of RV dealerships, uh, they have a trust issue with folks that they don't know and they're not familiar with. So they just don't want anybody roaming around their dealership lot. It took me several years to form the relationship that I have with the dealerships that I go to. Um, all that said, uh, you know, you have the relationship, you've looked for the units online that you want to view. The next part of it is making sure you have the right equipment to actually film it and film it in a way that's viewable and entertaining for the folks who are going to watch it. So I always have to make sure that I have the right camera gear and the right lenses for whatever I'm going to be filming. Fortunately, a lot of smartphones now have really, really great cameras. So if I don't have to carry, you know, a Pelican case with a bunch of cameras, oftentimes I can resort to using a GoPro um, or a like a Samsung S22 or an iPhone Pro 13. Um, those devices have really great wide angle, really great stability control, um, and you have a lot of really nice features for different lighting that you really are gonna need. But probably the single most important one is having a ultra wide angle lens because RVs are very small. So when you're going inside, you wanna be able to view them and be able to gather the light you need, which is super important because not all lenses can take in the same amount of light. So you wanna be able to gather as much light as you can to be able to get the shots to turn out well. And I've struggled a couple times in that arena. Um, some of the problems that you also run into is the fact that whenever you're filming in a low light environment and you try to use like an LED light, it can make everything kind of look blurred, washed out, or even strobe because the, the frequency that the LED light you're using operates at might, might conflict with what you're recording or how you're recording, especially if you're doing things in slow motion. So that said, the next step is to make sure everything is charged up. So usually the night before, I have all my batteries out, everything ready, and, um, and I usually carry three to four of each camera that I'm gonna bring with me. So again, when I use smartphones, I use smartphones I purchase specifically for recording. They stay in airplane mode, Wi-Fi, everything's turned off until I get done and I get back just to make sure I get all the right software updates. I can upload the video footage to the cloud the way I need it. And I delete everything off of the device app-wise that I don't need. And I turn everything off that 
I don't want running only because I want the, the camera to be as stable as possible. So whether it's a smartphone or a GoPro or whatever type of camera I'm using, I try to make sure it's set up specifically so it can work well for a long period of time in ultra high heat environments. That's probably the single biggest factor. Um, sometimes standing out in the sun is enough to cause a, a device to fail on you just because of the heat that is generated from the, the climate that you're in. So once you have all of that figured out, you know, the next most important aspect of it is making sure that you have enough battery life and enough memory um, in terms of, you know, memory cards and things, storage to be able to capture what you're going to be capturing. Now, a lot of folks ask why I don't record in 4K. I don't have the climate to record in 4K. Uh, when I tried recording in 4K for a couple of months, there were several times where the device that I was recording on would physically fail because of the heat that I'm trying to record in. When it's 110 degrees outside and you're trying to record in 4K, your camera's not going to last very long. Um, most of the time I might be able to make it through one video or half of a video before the camera would be dead the memory card would overheat, the camera itself would overheat, and you risk losing footage. And when I'm doing this, the most important aspect of what I'm doing is the footage. So if I take a chance at recording at a higher resolution, but that causes me to lose the footage, that's a big no-no for me. So that's why I record in full high definition at 60 frames. Sometimes I'll bring it down to, to 30 frames or 24 frames, depending on what I'm trying to do. But most of the time I keep it at 60 frames and 1080p. Um, it also helps me reduce file size so I can maximize memory storage and reduce the risk of a memory card being corrupted. There's so many YouTube channels out there that you may not be aware of. They've had to retake their footage multiple times because of corrupt memory cards. And my most important aspect of this is stability and making sure that equipment works and it lasts through the period of time that I'm trying to get it to work. So I end up buying very expensive memory cards, not the $20, the $30, or the $50. I end up buying $120, $150 memory cards for equipment that takes that. But as most of you are aware, uh, you know, iPhones, Samsung devices now only have internal memory and I have to get the highest memory version of any of those devices if I'm going to be using them for recording just because it, it's going to give me the, the most video I can capture without having to switch to another device. Um, the next part of it is prepping myself the following morning. So I get all my water, I get all my, my hydration materials ready, and usually I'll drink four bottles of water before I take off to film and I'll bring six bottles of frozen water with me that will be completely thawed by the time or during the filming process. Um, I pick out usually six to eight units at any specific dealership at a time, and then I plan on spending about six hours out at that dealership filming. Sometimes it's a little less, sometimes it's a little more. It depends on the size of the RV and what you're trying to capture, how much content. Usually about 45 minutes of filming will give me a 12 to 13 minute video. Um, usually an hour of filming will give me maybe a 20 minute video. So I have to know how much content I need to film, how many retakes I'm probably gonna need to do. And of course, as people come on the lot, they're walking it, salespeople might interrupt you occasionally, customers come on the lot. All of that factors into how long a video is gonna take. If airplanes are flying over, if motorcycles are driving by and they're really loud, if you have you know Mustangs or other cars with loud exhaust, they're going by semi trucks with their uh, engine exhaust brake. All of that stuff can make you determine if you have to reshoot a scene or not. So I, again, I give myself usually an hour to film an RV and it usually takes me between 30 minutes to an hour to film it depending on the size of the RV. And again, any interruptions or things that, that might interrupt me during the process of filming. Um, RVs down here in, in South Texas on the coast are very hot inside and none of them have the air conditioning running, none of them have fans on, none of them have windows open. Um, when I say windows open, like physically open, most of them will have the blinds down in some ways to keep them a little bit cooler. Um, and I don't have time for a dealership to be taking those units and moving up, to, moving them to full power. And they don't have time to be doing it as well because they're trying to, you know, maximize sales and make sure people are coming on the lot to view their units. So all that said, uh, the the aspect that is probably most impacting on me is the heat aspect. So. Um, those of you who live in the south, specifically on the coast, and have high humidity in the 80 to 85% range daily, 
can appreciate what I'm about to say next. Um, it's like swimming in heat. Uh, if you've ever like, you know, cooked a, a, a turkey in the oven and then you open up the oven and you get that rush of hot air, that's what it feels like moving into some of these RVs whenever you're, you're looking at them, whenever it's hot and sunny outside. So that's another aspect I have to be very, very conscious of. Um, some of the RVs I walk through are over 140 degrees inside. And I need to get in that RV, film everything that I can, and then get out of that RV, but at the same time present it to you in a way that doesn't make it seem like I'm being roasted alive in an RV. Um, if you're asking, I've blacked out twice. In the entire time I've, do, I've been doing this, I've blacked out twice in RVs just from heat exhaustion. Um, I've started kind of hydrating and preparing myself a little bit more to ensure that that doesn't happen. Uh, and you know, I haven't had a problem lately, but there was recently um, a time where I've, I really felt like I was going to black out, and I didn't, fortunately. But um, you have to get yourself out of those situations when you feel that they're about to occur. That's probably the, the most important thing to think about. You really have to get yourself out of a situation that you're getting that hot. Sometimes you push yourself. Sometimes you, you basically tell yourself, I just need to get this one final scene. I just need to make it through the restroom. I need to make it through the living room. I need to make it through this one final area to capture this one scene and then I'll be done and I can leave. Um, those are the times that it can get really dangerous, especially if you're you're sweating profusely or you are just, you, you're getting dizzy or nauseous or your vision starting to close in on you. And uh, when you do that upwards of six to eight times during a trip, is really where it starts to test you. So, you know, you gather all your footage, you make it through all the units, you hopefully are, you know, fine when you're done. Um, I'll usually take about a 10 minute break just sitting in my vehicle with the air conditioning on, or I'll go in the lobby and they'll usually have water for me or something cold that I can, I can drink or, or eat or something like a popsicle. Uh, I'll get in my truck and I'll run the air and I'll just kind of sit back and relax and try to regain myself. I'll usually drink a bottle of water because the bottles of water at that point are pretty much thawed. So. You got your footage. The first thing I need to start doing is transferring it. Um, you, you, you realize something quickly as a YouTube creator, and that is footage is everything. If you lose the footage, you've lost the entire reason of even going out there and doing it. And that is so critical for me to make sure that I don't lose my footage. And you can watch YouTubers at some point, they've probably lost some footage or it's become corrupt and it's so frustrating. Even if they don't tell you it, it's really frustrating. Um, sometimes if you're flying somewhere and you have to film something and you lose your footage, you've wasted an entire trip. Anyways, all that said, you have your footage um, and you need to get it off of the devices as quickly as possible, at least I do. So I have equipment in my truck that I bring with me that I can start transferring the data off of the devices and I can consolidate it onto a solid state hard drive as soon as possible. So. I do that in the parking lot. I'll start the process. Um, large files take a while to transfer, so I might have to constantly switch devices at red lights or when I pull over to a parking lot and just make sure that I start extracting the, the data. And it's essentially extracting a copy of it because I still have the main copy on all my recording devices and then I have a backup copy now that's on a solid state hard drive that is then pushing it all up to the cloud so it's also backed up a third time. Um, then once I get home, it's really the process of editing it, moving it all to my editing software, and um, usually editing one video, a shorter video, would probably take about an hour to two hours, and then editing a longer video can take anywhere between four to six hours, uh, depending on how complex it is and how many changes, and more importantly, how many times I messed up or how many times I had to stop and pause and, and deal with something else that might have been going on or avoid some loud noise. So the editing process takes certainly the most, most amount of time because you can film a video. If it's a 45 minute filming, you got to think you're probably stopping to do edits and transitions and things like that multiple times per every minute. And it can make a 45 minute video from an editing perspective take an hour and a half to two hours easily. I think anybody who creates a lot of content on YouTube and has any level of quality that they inject into it realizes that. So 
yeah, editing. And then once it's edited, I need to get it off my computer onto the cloud and into YouTube as quickly as possible. So again, I don't like data being held in an area where it's just not doing anything. It needs to be moved to the platform, to YouTube as quickly as possible. So uh, I can free up memory space again. I can delete things and not worry about if I still need to edit it or finish it and I can have it ready and queued up and in line for when it needs to be published. So that's kind of the way it goes. And then of course, all my other videos in between are filler videos that essentially give me additional content on other topics. And some of those topics are very complex. Some of them require three to four to five hours of filming for one 12 minute video and a lot of editing. So some of those videos can take upwards of three to four days to edit only because the process of whatever I was doing took that long. So if you wanna get into this, especially if you're in the South or if you're in a really hot climate environment, especially if you're in a humid climate environment where you're gonna be just bleeding off water, you need to be prepared for the physical aspect of it. Um, a lot of folks, you know, would easily equate this, especially let's say you've been in construction or you've been in some type of really labor intensive job, um, you know, at some point in your life and you've moved to trying to make videos. You know, the easiest way to equate this to, to that would be you're going to be in the sun. You are going to be in very, very hot RVs. You are going to have to focus on trying to make every video sound fresh and relaxing as if you just got out there and you're just filming that one RV. Because at the end of the day, uh, you have to maximize how much you can film in a single day. And you have to also work that into a schedule. Do you have another job? Do you have a full-time job that you have to focus on? When can you film so it doesn't impact that? And you know, when can you film so you have the highest likelihood of capturing all the content you're looking to capture, while at the same time making sure that you're doing it in a way that sounds good, that has quality integrated into it, you're getting all the right information. You know, once you start getting heat exhausted, you start forgetting things. You start saying weird things. You might say travel trailer instead of fifth wheel. You might say pin box instead of conventional hitch, or you might, you know, say different things that just aren't right. And occasionally you'll pick those up in my videos. I'll just mess up. I'll say the wrong thing. And it's not because I'm trying to. It's only because, you know, I'm trying to factor in, uh, you know, how long I've been out there and how long I've been exposed to these hot boxes that I've been walking through. Anyways, guys, I sure hope this helps you all understand a little bit more of what goes into Big Truck, Big RV. Um, and as I grow and I bring in more people and more, more help, which I have some help now, but I don't have any help in terms of going out and filming this stuff, um, it might make my life a little easier. But there's, there's a stress factor that goes into making sure you can get the content you're looking for in the time frame that you have, then being able to edit it and upload it in a way that, that really clears off your palette for your next project. So I hope you've enjoyed this video. I hope this clarifies things for some folks who've just wanted to know what it's like to be big truck, big RV, and and the, the, the things that go into making videos on YouTube. And this isn't unique for just me. I mean, a lot of people do this exact same process for content that they produce on an entirely different topic. But if you are a YouTube content creator, please leave a comment below. I would love to know you know, the compare and contrast on how you feel about the content you create and if it's in a similar manner, or perhaps if the same things stress you out. Guys, if you haven't had a chance, please take a moment, subscribe to my channel, give me a thumbs up, and we'll talk to you again very soon.